we talk about sharing a bit too much, don't we? I'm here to preach this morning, uh, and I'm not going to apologise for that. Uh, I'm going to preach to you from the Word of God. And so before I do that, I'd just like to uh, come alongside and to, to add my prayer. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, what has been expressed in the fellowship there. Uh, I know there are many needs in the fellowship, Lord. And uh, we thank you for those people who are so good and so helpful, Lord, um, and, and encouraging, Lord, and we, we, we just thank you for that. But we just pray, Lord, now that as we come to your word, that your Holy Spirit will just draw out of these verses that which you wish to say to the people, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would just make it come alive to us, Lord. Uh, I pray that your spirit might take these words and might apply them to each life, Lord. That you might, uh, uh, as it were, sometimes what is needed, Lord, that our heart might be pierced even by the words uh, that are preached and that are, that are brought out here, Lord. I pray that you would give me that power, Lord, that endowment of power from on high in myself, in my flesh, Lord. Uh, I am weak. Uh, Lord, I fail, uh, but I know that uh, by the power of your Spirit, Lord, uh, that your word can be proclaimed, Lord, and that we could, it could be like spiritual food for us, Lord, that we can grow thereby, Lord. And so I just pray for the power of your Spirit to come upon the word of God today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so we're going to start off, if you'd like to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 9, is the verse we're going to be looking at this morning, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 9, just a, just a short verse, John chapter 9 verse 4. And it's the Lord Jesus who's speaking, and he says, I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Just a short verse, but I'll just read it again. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And some have said, well, uh, there's going to come a time where it's going to be very difficult for Christians. It's going to be a time where you, it's hard to preach the Word of God, where maybe you know you have to hide the fact that you're a Christian. Um, that may be so. Uh, but I don't actually believe that that's what Jesus is saying here. So I wanted to just offer you my understanding of this first. Just go to John chapter 4, John 4, 34, 34, and it says this, Jesus saith unto them, my meat, or, or my food, is to do the will of him that sent me, now listen, and to finish his work. To finish his work. So come back to John 9 verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, because night cometh when no man can work. What's the context? When we come to a verse of scripture, it's always helpful to know what the context is. Well, the context is that Jesus has just healed a man who was blind from birth. And so we go through the Gospels, Quite often, Jesus is healing lots of people, isn't he? He's healing people on the Sabbath and upsetting the religious people a lot. Uh, religious people, in inverted commas, will always get upset uh, when God's will overrules their traditions. Now, you remember that the Sabbath was, was instituted by God, but the Pharisees had made it something that it was never meant to be. Do you remember some things they scrupled really, really kind of seriously and thoroughly, like the Sabbath? Other things they completely overlooked, like mercy and justice, things like that. 
And so they made the Sabbath the thing that it, it, it ought not to be. They were saying, oh, you shouldn't heal people on the Sabbath and so on. But Jesus, he, Jesus just doesn't stop healing people, does he? And helping people. And he's working uh, so hard because his life, as it were, is like a day. There's a short period of time on which he will be here on this earth. And what I believe he's saying in John 9 verse 4 is, you know, uh, uh, that I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, while I am here on this earth. Because there will come a time where I'm taken up. I'm taken up into heaven. And, and that will be the end of my time here on earth. These works that I'm working now, they will come to an end. As the master, so it is with his servants. Our work on earth will also come to a finish one day, won't it? What we're here on earth to do, there will come a time where that stops and then we will not be able to work beyond that point. When, when the day ends, and as it were, uh, <coughs> it's night, it's over, we will not be able to do any more works. Uh, you can't work beyond that. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. In other words, we can't, we can't return, we can't come and correct our errors. Uh, there, there is no second chance to work in those areas of our lives that we've neglected. Can't go back to our relatives, uh, whether it's husband or wife, children, parents, grandparents. We don't get a second chance to come back and say, well, actually, perhaps I should have shared the gospel with them. Actually, perhaps... I should have expressed, as, as was prayed, the love of God more to my family, to my friends, whoever. We don't get a second chance to do that. You cannot work uh, when that day, the day of your life is over. John Wesley rather famously said, I have thought I am a creature of a day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit come from God, just hovering over the great gulf till a few moments hence. I am no more seen. I drop into unchangeable eternity. Just sobering words, aren't they? He said, your life, my life, it's like we're just hovering <coughs> over this great gulf. You know, we're just about to pass into unchangeable eternity. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a flash. What was that? Well, that was your life. That was the moment where your foot touched this earth just for a moment. And you would say, well, my life's, you know, I've lived a long time. Not compared to eternity, you haven't. Not at all. You know, you could live to be a hundred. Sounds Wow, the per so, you know, these people who live to be a hundred. Uh, my dad said that one of, one of my grannies, uh, not my granny, my uh, auntie, had, had lived till she was something like 105. Uh, that sounds so old, so long, but it isn't. Not compared to eternity. It's just like, that. it's gone. So the, our life here on earth is so brief. And then we step out into that un changeable eternity. Can't be changed. Can't go back and say, well actually now I see now I see where I'm going. Now I see what this involves. I look back on my life and see it very differently and I need to go back and I need to do some things. Remember when Jesus talks about the the, uh, the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man enjoyed himself during his time, his life on earth. He, he feasted sumptuously. Uh, but Lazarus the beggar, he was at the gates there, he was begging for his food. But when they died, when they passed from this world, uh, it was the poor man, it was the beggar who was enjoying the blessings of God. And it was the rich man who was suffering. And the rich man was, 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 knew Lazarus and he said, can you tell Lazarus to come and dip his finger in some water that I might get some relief out of this torment? Can you send someone to tell my family? Can you send someone to tell 
my brothers not to come to this place. But the Lord says, no, there's a great gulf that's fixed. You can't go back. You can't go back and say, oh, I need to tell you this. I need to warn you about this. When, you're, when the, the, the day of your life is over, that's it. It's over. We can't uh, go back and put things right or change things. So those are sobering thoughts, aren't they? Sovereign thoughts, particularly if you do not have this morning the assurance of salvation. To think that you are just hovering for a moment over this great gulf and you're going to be entering into unchangeable eternity. Do you have the assurance of salvation? Do you know that you are a Christian this morning? That you've been born again by the Spirit of God? Sobering thoughts for those that do not have the assurance of of salvation, or even the, for those that protest and prevaricate when the question of salvation is pressed. But I'll say this, when the question of salvation is pressed, often it's because love is there. It's the expression of God's love to you. What of the believer, though? How are we to respond to Jesus' words? What does this day mean to us? Jesus says that while it is day, his disciples should work, didn't they? So while, while it's day, you're supposed to be uh, working. And uh, in fact, Jesus uses a number of titles to... Um, to talk about what his disciples will be, to characterize them, he says they will be laborers, servants, handmaidens, workers. In fact, when he say to Peter, follow me and I will make you uh, fishers of men. You know, a fisherman works hard, doesn't he? Now, if I start preaching to you about the importance of works, um, I might have to start ducking down behind this pulpit because sometimes it feels a little bit like the last taboo. We know that we are saved by grace through faith. And uh, the Ephesians 2 even adds in there, not of works. And so what we do, we, we emphasize grace so much, and rightly so, salvation comes by grace through faith. But does that mean then that Jesus doesn't care about works? Does that mean that works, in that sense, then are not important? If it's all about grace, and if it's all about faith, does it mean that, you know, basically, works, forget works, it's all about grace, it's all about faith? Well, um, I think it's interesting that. Uh, we, we only come a little bit further through that, the, the, if you like, the grace chapter, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. But I think we get to verse 10 of the same chapter, and it says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, listen, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we shall walk in them. God has prepared works in advance for you and me to do. He has laid them out, as it were, on our path, on our walk, that he wants us to do. Now, does that undermine grace? Does that undermine faith? Not at all. Because we know that we are not saved by doing good works. If you think you're saved by good works, you're not saved. Because you've misunderstood the means by which we become Christians. It's by grace, the undeserved, unmerited favour of God, and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a sense in which grace and works are, are mutually exclusive. You know, if it's of works, then it's no more by grace. But there's another sense in which works and faith are not, it's not either or. The two uh, work together. 
It's not a question of, oh, I believe in faith. Oh, really, oh, well, I believe in works. The Apostle James corrected this misinterpretation of the Scriptures a long time ago. He said, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James 2.17 So, is Jesus interested in works? If Jesus were to come here today, if we were to walk into this building, would he, would, would he be asking us, would he be saying, well, what, what works are you doing? Or would he be saying, well, how's your faith? I think many people say, we'd well, probably just be saying, how's your faith? But it's interesting, in the book of Revelation, what does Jesus say when he, as it were, comes to the churches? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, he says, I know thy works. To the angel of the church of Smyrna, I know thy works. To the angel of the church of Pergamos, I know thy works. Thyatira, I know thy works. Sardis, I know thy works. Philadelphia, I know thy works. Laodicea, I know thy works. In fact, he says to the church in Ephesus, do the works that you did before. Sounds to me like he is interested in what works we're doing. That doesn't make salvation by works. Someone said to me, oh, I read some of this Arminius guy. He sounds like a works guy to me. I don't know what a works guy is. But I know he, that Arminius believed in grace and he believed in faith. And he believed that salvation was not by works. So you see the danger. If I start to preach this morning about works, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we are saved by good works, but what I'm saying is that doesn't mean works aren't important. The scriptures are full of them, and also it, James is saying that's the proof that shows that you have genuine faith, God-given faith, that you produce God good works. Rather, quote to you William Tyndale, who is certainly not a, work, a works guy. He says this that it is a sure and evident sign that there is no faith in the heart but a dead imagination and dream which they falsely call faith if they do not produce good works. Wow. You know, that's pretty hard hitting, isn't it? Saying you've imagined that you've got faith if you do not produce any good works. It says that you have a dream, you're dreaming it. It's not real. What was Christ's own example? My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his what? Work. To finish his work. So what then, what are the works that Christians are supposed to do? Well, the Bible teaches us that it's, you know, it's right and we should work. In a, in a sort of secular sense, go out and work and, and, and do a job. Um, but, but is that really what the Bible's talking about here? Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 27. religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In other words, to, this is, what he's saying is, this is real, true Christianity. And by inferring that, what he's saying is anything that isn't this is not true Christianity. It's not true religion in, in the real sense of what religion should be. This and only this is true Christianity to bring comfort, help, counsel to those that are in affliction, to those particularly that are neglected or that are needful. Widows, orphans, there was no social security in those days. 
You know, these were people who were in great need. And he's saying, look, this is, this is part of what it means to be a Christian, is to go to those people and help them, pray for them, care about them, maybe counsel them. But something else as well, to keep yourself or to keep oneself unspotted or untainted by the world. So that's what your religion, is. that's what you do as a Christian, is care about all these people, express love to them in whatever way it may be, maybe to pray for them, it may be to help them practically, maybe able to maybe to take them through the word of God and give them some of those we sang about it before, don't we standing on the promises of God, maybe they need to hear some of the great promises of God, but it's something else as well, it's to separate yourself from the world, from worldly values, worldly customs, to keep oneself untainted from the world. There is another work that we are called to do. Let's go to Mark 15, Gospel of Mark. Mark 16, Mark 16 and verse 15. And he, he being Jesus, said unto them, the disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. It's called the Great Commission. That is part of the work that you and I are called to do. Now, not everybody is called to stand up as an as evangelist in the middle uh, of a town centre and preach out, preach out a word. But we are all called to bear witness to Jesus Christ and for what he's done for us in our lives. That's part of the work that we are called to do. It's one of the works that God has prepared in advance or ordained for us to do. Something else, another work that... Uh, we are called to do, Jesus reminds his disciples, to teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. We are to teach people, we are to teach others to obey the commandments of Christ. And again, it's a shock for some people that Christ even has commandments, but he does. He does. Lay not up treasure upon earth. That's one of his commandments. Love your neighbour as yourself. That's one of his commandments. And there are many others. This is what characterises the Christian life. Paul says to the Corinthians, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. You're considering going into ministry. If you have a desire to do that, or to be an elder, or whatever it is, are you prepared to spend and be spent for others? That's what Paul is saying. He is consumed by good works. Not in order to be saved, but because that is what saved people do. That is the desire of their heart. All these things that I've listed to you, Sharing of the gospel, the helping of people, praying for people, counselling people, teaching others to obey the commandments of Christ. Christians don't do these because they think it gives them favour with God. They do it because God has changed their heart and given them that desire. They don't, they don't want to sit at home and please themselves or spend all their money on themselves or, you know, whatever it is. They want to go out when it's cold and rainy and wet and share Jesus Christ with other people. They want to put themselves in that situation where you're pacing up and down and going, oh, no, 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 what's the first thing I can say to this person? Lord, I feel so weak, I feel so useless and hopeless. I look at my life and I think, but, but I know I've got to share you with this person because I love them and because I love you. And they need to know. They need to know because they're hovering over that great gulf because they're hanging there, as it were, in mid-air. Because they're about to pass into unchangeable eternity. And I'm here. Lord, send me. That's the heart of a Christian. 
That's why we do it. Not because we're professionals or experts or anything like that, but because the love of God burns in our hearts. And we want to express it. We, 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 we cannot hold it in. What is it uh, that Jeremiah says? It's like a fire within his bones. It's Jeremiah, isn't it? It's like a fire within his bones. Can't hold it in. And the love of God is like that. Can't hold it in. You've got to share it and tell others. Whatever costs that may be. Problem is, you see, we have that hunger, we have that thirst, but also we suffer from the kind of society that we live in. You know, we have, or, or, or we suffer from, what I call the McDonald's drive through mentality. Now, what do I mean by that? Anyone ever been to McDonald's drive through Oh, the shame of it. Yeah, yeah, McDonald's drive through you, you go through there and you order your food, whatever it is, you know, cheeseburger and so on, and a drink. And what people do is, not all people, uh, but what some people do is they park up in the car park and uh, they park up maybe about three feet, that's about a metre, from a bin. Okay, they sit there in the car and they eat their, their burger and they, they, they drink their Coke and then uh, they, they open their window and they chuck it on the ground. Anyone ever seen that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 you've seen that. Yeah, it drives me mad. I just think, well, you could have just walked the bins just there. They throw it out the window on, on the ground and they drive off. Why? Because they know that some McDonald's employee, probably some spotty faced young lad or, or you know, some older person who's on minimum wage will come up and will do the job for them. They'll pick it up and they'll put it in the bin. And the problem is that with us here in the West, we think, well, I know I'm supposed to do this stuff, but somebody else will do it. I wonder if that was what was in the mind of the Levite when he walked down the road to Jericho and he saw that man lying there by the side of the road, bleeding, injured, that he thought, well, that's a shame, but somebody else will do it. Maybe the priest thought that too. Maybe somebody else will come along and they'll do it. Well, God has prepared works for you and I to do. And I've heard, heard people say, well, yeah, but, you know, if I don't do the work, I'll just lose my reward. Why do you want to lose a reward? Why do you not want God to say, here, you did what I asked you to do. Here's your reward. What a privilege it is to serve the Lord and to do His works. You see, it's even more serious than that. It's not just a question of missing a reward. Ezekiel 3.18 says this. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. For his blood will I require at thine hand. Yes, he'll die. Yes, it's his fault. Yes, he is without excuse. But you play a part in this also. There are some people that only you can reach. Okay? There are some people you are the nearest Christian to them. What, 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 what happens these days is people say, well, you know, uh, uh, Auntie Edith, you know, I just wish she'd get saved. Uh, uh, but there's, a, there's, there's an, a big evangelist coming to town. I'm going to get tickets to go and see the evangelist. He's coming in a month. And I'm going to get some tickets to see the big evangelist. I'm going to ask her, can you all pray for Auntie Edith and pray that she'll accept this ticket that I'm going to buy her so I can get her to the evangelist so she can the gospel and hopefully get saved? Well, why don't you tell her? What, is she going to... 
what happens if something, what if something happens to her in that month? What if she doesn't make it to the end of the month? What if she gets knocked down by a car or something? She is hovering over the great gulf. She's about to enter into unchangeable eternity. You are and I am. Because we don't know how long we've got. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know, we've no idea how long we've got on this earth. Because when we look at our friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues, people we see every day, don't wait to take them to the big evangelist. They need to, it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation, not the evangelist. He's just bringing the message. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's the power. That's the thing that's going to save that person. That evangelist hasn't got a bigger Bible than you. He's got the same scriptures, the same promises that he's got. Now, he's got a ministry from God, yeah. But God is not going to doesn't want you to hang around until someone with that ministry comes along. He wants you to share the gospel with your friends and your family. And to share it because, not because you think that you will win points with God for doing that, but because you love them. Because that's what people who love others do. If you love somebody and you know they're not a Christian and they are about to enter into eternity, what's the most loving thing you can do for them? Tell them about Jesus. Give them a chance. It's an amazing privilege that we have that we can be the servants of God, isn't it? That we can be his workers, his laborers. And we have this time, this day of our life, to do that work. When it finishes, that's it. Can't go back. Can't put those things right. What a privilege to work for the Master. But you know, we have even more privilege than that. When you become a born-again Christian, you're not just a servant. You're a son. You're an inheritor of all the things that God has promised. We are sons, even if you are female this morning, you are a son, because the son is the inheritor of the things of God. But there's another term as well that Jesus uses. And I'll just finish with this scripture now. There's an incredible term that Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we just read about it in Revelation. That amazing vision of John has it, you know, his, his, his voice was like the sound of many waters. You know, you see him in his glory, as it were, that vision before John. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the first and the last, says this to you and me. John 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not. What his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. What a privilege. Says, you know, Moses was called the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God. Jesus Christ says, You're my friends. You're my friends. If you do my will. What does it mean to love God and to love your neighbour as yourself? It means to do the will of God. It means to walk in obedience because you love God and because you love your neighbour. Works is not a dirty word. It doesn't mean that you don't believe in grace or faith. But it means that your, the grace that has been shown to you and the faith that you have in Jesus is seen by the works that you do. It's an outworking of it. I put it this way, you know, the Bible talks about how the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But our hearts can't contain all the love of God. It starts, have you ever done that where you, 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 you pour something into a glass and you get distracted for a moment and the glass starts overflowing and it's all over the table before you, before you know it. Uh, our, our children, our quite young children, sometimes that have the children try and pour a drink and it will just 
and they'll say, that is, and it's all over the table, because it's just poured, the glass can't contain it, poured too much in there. God pours too much love into our hearts, so we can't hold on to it, you can't keep it all to yourself, it has to go out to other people, it overflows. Rivers of living water come out of us, they pour out of us. And that's exactly how God has intended it to be. That the love of God should not remain in our hearts, but should pour out and should, and should touch every other person. What works of love will you do for the Master this week? Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to, to take up the challenge, Lord, this morning. And if we've never done it before, Lord, maybe to just take a leaflet off that table and to put it into somebody's hand. Or to phone up somebody we've not seen for a while and just say, just phoning to see how you are. Just seeing if there's anything you need, if there's anything I can do for you. Lord, help us to express the love of God to others, Lord. Help us to keep ourselves unspotted, untainted by this world, Lord, that we might live our lives to the glory of God. In Jesus' name.